In 10 weeks, 40.7 million Americans have filed jobless claims. That's more claims filed in the previous 178 weeks combined. Think of it this way. If you took every man, woman, and child living in New York City, L.A., and Dallas and multiplied them not by two, but by three, you'd have about the same number of people who have filed claims since the start of this. Ever since the days of World War II, U.S. unemployment has risen and dropped slowly, gradually, revealing recessions, periodic descents followed by assets, not one of which touched double digits until April, when the U.S. recorded the largest one-month percentage increase in our history, a shock to the American economic system. They knew they had to get here early because last week the pantry ran out of food. That line stretched, as you say, at one point for half a mile. It stretches still right now, hundreds at least still in line, immigrants mostly there, uh, who will not get money from the government. Their restaurant and their construction and cleaning jobs have all shut down if they can't get food for their families here. They may not have food for their families. Bay Area medical teams say hospitals have not been overwhelmed by COVID-19 cases, but they have been surprised by something else, a sharp rise in suicides. The numbers that we've seen uh, are sort of unprecedented. We've never seen numbers like this uh, in such a short period of time. Uh, I mean, we've seen a year's worth of of suicide attempts uh, in the last four weeks. It has shocked even longtime employees. Casey Hansen has worked as a trauma nurse at John Muir Medical Center in Walnut Creek for almost 33 years. What I've seen recently, uh, I've never seen before. I've never seen so much intentional injury. The trauma team here says they are mostly seeing young adults die by suicide. They are worried about the mounting effects of loneliness and job loss as this quarantine continues. The social isolation um, has a price. Dr. Fauci, America has changed so rapidly in the last week. When is life going to get back to normal? How long is this going to last? You know, Nora, we don't know how long it lasts. If you look at what's happened in China, they went way up and they're starting to come right down now. The Korea curve is peaking. It's starting to kind of flatten out. So you usually measure in a matter of several weeks to a couple of months. Don't go to crowded places. France is trying to close down restaurants right. and cafes exactly. and bars. Yeah. Should that happen here in the United States? You know, every single day we meet with the task force and we take a look at what's going on. And you don't want to make a pronouncement that no one should ever go into a restaurant. I mean, I think that might be overkill right now, but everything is on the table. We're faced with a real challenge. You can't stay shut down forever. So it's going to have to be a balance between containing the potential resurgence, which we will hopefully have the capability of doing at the same time as we march forward to some sort of normalization and reopening not only our country, but the rest of the world. Because if you look at what's going on, so many other countries are trying to do the same thing we're trying to do. The question is, we needed to do it prudently and safely in the context of our ability to respond when you do see these bit of resurgences. And a final question, are you breathing a sigh of relief yet? A sigh of relief? No, I, I never get ahead of myself. I'll greet every side, you know, as Yogi Berry used to say, it ain't over till it's over, you know, and, and, and that's when I'll read, uh, I'll breathe a sigh of relief when we're really yeah. completely out of this, right? Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Good to be with you. Our next expert is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Tony knows what to do. Dr. Anthony S. Fauci. Tony and I. We turn now to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci. Thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. My name is uh, Dr. Tony Fauci. I'm the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH. Even celebrities like NBA superstar Steph Curry. Dr. Fauci. Hey, Steph. See Dr. Fauci as the crisis's MVP. Thank you again for you and your entire team uh, protecting, protecting all of us. Plenty are grateful. You can join Fauci fan clubs. There's Fauci footwear. 
even fancy Fauci food. Donuts, in this case. You can buy a Honk for Dr. Fauci yard sign, or you can take a nap on your I Heart Fauci throw pillow. You can ponder whether to go outside while wearing your What Would Fauci Do t-shirt. Or you can stay inside and light your Dr. Fauci prayer candle. And remember Shepard Fairey's famous Obama image? Well, Dr. Fauci inspired others to copy it, giving us a new way to look at hope. President George Herbert Walker Bush called Dr. Fauci a hero, and we all subscribe to that. I think of Dr. Fauci. Probably never heard of him. You did. Ann heard him. He's a very fine research top doctor at National Institute of Health, working hard doing something about research on this disease of AIDS. I came up with the idea that we should hold a special session of the Security Council on HIV AIDS. I was told by everyone, including my own staff, you can't do this, it's not done, it's not in the UN Charter. And I said, but AIDS is a security issue because it's destroying the security, the stability of countries. I call to order this uh, first meeting of the United Nations Security Council in the 21st century. When 10 people in sub-Saharan Africa are infected every minute, when 11 million children have... It was the first time that the Security Council debated on something that was not, let's say, war and peace. When a single disease threatens everything from economic strength to peacekeeping, that was a breakthrough because it opened so many doors and presidents, prime ministers say, oh, it was debated in the Security Council, this must be a serious problem. When I came to Congress, my first statement on the floor was, I've come here to fight HIV and AIDS. As the president arrived for his State of the Union speech, everyone expected him to issue an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein. They were not prepared for what came first. Today on the continent of Africa, nearly 30 million people have the AIDS virus. Yet across that continent, only 50,000 AIDS victims. Only 50,000 are receiving the medicine they need. I ask the Congress to commit $15 billion over the next five years, including nearly $10 billion in new money, to turn the tide against AIDS in the most afflicted nations of Africa and the Caribbean. The President announced the initiative in Washington and raised the hope that earlier treatment and prevention would soon lead to the beginning of the end of AIDS. Few could have imagined that we'd be talking about the real possibility of an AIDS-free generation. But that's what we're talking about. That's why we're here. The ultimate tool will be a vaccine. And scientists are making great progress. here today to make it absolutely clear. The United States is committed and will remain committed to achieving an AIDS-free generation. We will not back off. We will not back down. We will fight for the resources necessary to achieve this historic milestone. Finally, as you, I'm sure, have read in the papers, given the fact that we now have the virus in our hands, it is quite possible, in fact, it's invariable, that we will develop a vaccine for AIDS.
Why do you believe that HIV does cause AIDS? Because that's all the information that I've been given. Because you've never been taught anything different. We have uh, we don't heard it. Because that's what the scientific community has told us. Scientists are supposed to observe, experiment, and reason from what they observe. They're not supposed to grab hold of an idea and cling to it and adjust everything else in their perceptions to fit that idea. I happen to be one now of the few people who was there literally from the very first week that this was recognized as a new disease. Let's talk about HIV. Right. When did people first realize that people were getting um, HIV and then AIDS? Uh, that was in the early 80s, I suppose. But why did it take scientists so long to figure out what, a what was causing HIV and then how to prevent HIV from becoming AIDS? Why did that take well, so long? Well, I'll answer your first question. It, we first became aware of it in a report of the MMWR from the CDC on June 4th of 1981, followed by one in July 5th, 1981, of the first cases from Los Angeles and then from New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. I don't think at all that it was a long time before we found out what it was. Uh, the first cases were recognized, even though it was around probably 10 years before, in the summer of 1981. The virus was discovered in the spring of 1983 and proven to be the cause. Discovered of by whom? By, uh, by Francois Barre, Sinoussi, and, uh, and now, Luc Was Montagnier. the Nobel Prize awarded to people who... Yes, yes. It, it, it was discovered by one group in France, but proven definitively to be the cause of AIDS by Bob Gallo here when okay. he was at the NIH. They, did they both win the Nobel Prize? Uh, Francois Barre Sinoussi and, uh, and Luc Montagnier won the Nobel Prize. Bob Gallo did not. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, the probable cause of AIDS has been found, a variant of a known human cancer virus. Second, not only has the agent been identified, but a new process has been developed to mass produce this virus. Thirdly, with discovery of both the virus and this new process, we now have a blood test for AIDS. With the blood test, we can identify AIDS victims with essentially 100% certainty. You know, it was a political proclamation of scientific truth. Um, Robert Gallo successfully lobbied Margaret Heckler, who was then the Secretary of Health and Human Services, to proclaim his view of what caused AIDS to be absolute scientific truth. And she went on with him in tow and announced that. The conference was held before any of Robert Gallo's papers were published, therefore before any other scientist had a chance to review them and uh, look at the evidence and see if he got it right or wrong. And it was also done right when Gallo had patented uh, the HIV antibody test. So they made sure that his patent rights were protected first, then they did the press conference, and then before Gallo's papers appeared in print, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services decided from now on we are only going to fund AIDS research that assumes that Robert Gallo's virus is the cause. We are not going to fund research into any other possibilities. Therefore, the scientists who might have wanted to critique Gallo's papers would not be able to do so, at least uh, not with... Um, anything supported by the federal government, which is virtually all science in this country today. When uh, Bob Gallo proved that it was the etiologic agent in 1984, we had a, a diagnostic test approved by the FDA in 1985. So the, the test was developed. It was gone through the appropriate validation and approved by the FDA. That was really quick, from literally less than a year from the time that it was shown to be the virus that causes this disease. Just because Bob Gallo gets up, takes his blood, sunglasses off, and says, gentlemen, you discovered the cause of AIDS. That's all we have. New York Times article, CDC report, that's all we have. That's not enough. That's not enough to, to you know, that is not sufficient to, to like, publish even a, a meager little scientific paper somewhere. That isn't enough for scientists to believe some inconsequential fact about some star 50 light years away. You know. That's certainly not enough to treat at the cost of million, billions of dollars a year and at the cost of a lot of lives.
and anguish and just destroyed, you know, lives that have been totally ruined by this thing on the basis of some flimsy little statement made by a guy who's known to be a crook in lots of other ways. He lied about a whole lot of other stuff. Why are we trusting that? He was a witness in the courtroom. We wouldn't trust his testimony. We've caught him in too many lies. You don't trust him anymore. At the University of California in Berkeley, Duisburg became a world-renowned retrovirologist in the cancer program and the first man to map the genetic structure of retroviruses like HIV back in 1970. His honors include membership in the National Academy of Sciences due to his discovery of cancer-causing genes. Having researched retroviruses for over 30 years, some have called him the world's foremost expert in retrovirology. Dr. Duisburg was somewhat skeptical of Gallo's AIDS virus announcement. I wasn't madly impressed by it because what else would you expect from a person like Gallo who had studied retroviruses all his life that he would say retrovirus is causing AIDS. That seemed to me the first coincidence that made me wonder whether that was an authentic claim or going to be an authentic claim but um, I would say uh, it was not a surprise that he would say that he said it before that it would cause leukemia or things like Alzheimer's disease, neurological diseases, and it failed. So this one, I was not too impressed that this would, was going to be a winner now. And it would have been for the first time that a retrovirus would have been pinned down as a cause of a human disease or even a disease in wild animals. For 18 months, Peter Duisburg studied every scientific publication on HIV and AIDS he could get a hold of. When he finally published his observations in cancer research in 1987, he stood alone against the tide of popular opinion and the government-funded AIDS industry. His position has become well known. He argues that HIV is not causing AIDS. It's a harmless passenger virus that has lived in humans for centuries without causing diseases. He believes AIDS is the result of other non-infectious factors like drug use. And ironically enough, AZT, the highly toxic medication prescribed to treat AIDS patients, actually does what the virus cannot, that is, causes AIDS itself. Though Dr. Duisburg's arguments were ridiculed by many and ignored by most, many of his colleagues studied his research and came to the same conclusion. Something is terribly wrong with the war on AIDS. Dr. Richard Stroman recalls the impact of Duisburg's arguments in cancer research. It was a remarkable review, and it raised the fundamental issues about virus, virus, uh, uh, viruses as a cause of both cancer and, and immunosuppression, uh, basic questions that haven't been really responded to in any meaningful way in, in, uh, in the almost 10 years since that paper was published. Soon other top scientists joined Duisburg and Stroman in questioning the HIV hypothesis also. Nobel Prize winners Dr. Walter Gilbert of Harvard and Kerry Mullis who invented the PCR. Dr. Charles Thomas, a former Harvard professor, organized a consortium of 12 signatories to address the issue. They would in time become the group for scientific reappraisal of the HIV AIDS hypothesis. We started out by uh, writing a letter to Nature calling for a reappraisal of the evidence for and against the hypothesis that HIV did in fact do all these things and um, there were about 10 or 12 signatories to this letter and it was rejected even though many uh, of the signers of the letter were certainly reputable people we tried Nature magazine and it, it was ignored then we tried the New England Journal JAMA and so forth and Lancet in each case we were rejected that they would not publish this letter. It was only four sentences long. It read, um, it is widely believed by the general public that a retrovirus called HIV causes a group of diseases called AIDS. Many biomedical scientists now question this hypothesis. We propose a thorough reappraisal of the existing evidence for and against this hypothesis be conducted by a suitable independent group. We further propose that critical epidemiological studies be devised and undertaken. And that is certainly a hardly a bomb-throwing letter, but nonetheless they would have none of it. And being rejected made us angry. 
So we decided to extend the list of signatories. So it jumped to 30, and then to 50, and then to 100. And then by 1994, up to 600, 188 of whom have advanced degrees. We publish a newsletter. We have a website. So it's a fairly large organization now. Though the scientific establishment has continually ignored Duisburg and the group for reappraisal, some individuals are having second thoughts. At the San Francisco International AIDS Conference in 1990, Dr. Luc Montagnier, who discovered the virus originally, six months before Gallo's claim, made a startling statement. HIV might be harmless. Against his own interest, Montagnier's statement should have been earth-shaking. But the conventioners paid it little attention and went right on talking about new antiviral drug treatments. Why is the scientific community ignoring the dangerous ramifications of this essential question about the cause of AIDS? Do we have an answer? Yes, in retrospect we certainly do. Too many people are making too much money out of it. And money is much stronger than truth. When I was looking at this data with our team the other night, it was reminiscent of 34 years ago in 1986 when we were struggling for drugs for HIV, and we had nothing. And there was a lot of anecdotal reports about things that maybe they were, maybe not. People were taking different kinds of drugs. And we did the first randomized placebo-controlled trial with AZT, which turned out to give an effect that was modest. In 1987, the war on AIDS took another drastic turn for the worse. AZT, a toxic chemotherapy deemed too poisonous for cancer treatment, was approved to treat symptomatic and asymptomatic HIV patients in an attempt to kill the virus that causes AIDS. AZT is a DNA chain terminator, a poison designed to randomly destroy the DNA synthesis of reproducing cells. It was initially developed to treat leukemia victims, but after animal testing, the FDA determined that it was too toxic for use in human beings and banned it. But in 1987, when the AIDS scare hit its height, the FDA was pressured into approving the drug for use for the first time in human beings, even for people who were healthy and showed no sign of AIDS. AZT is highly mutagenic, meaning that it destroys the genes and cells and has been shown to cause cancer in rodents. It targets the bone marrow where B lymphocyte blood cells are being made. These are the very cells an AIDS patient needs most for immunity. AZT destroys randomly bone marrow, kidneys, liver, intestines, muscle tissue, the brain, and central nervous system. Peter Duisburg claims AZT actually causes AIDS itself. AZT deaths does directly causing AIDS and defining diseases. You know, AIDS is a lot of the things, but it doesn't cause Kaposi sarcoma, I think. But it does cause immunodeficiency. It was designed to do that. It was designed to kill human cells. In fact, the manufacturer says that uh, specifically that it can cause uh, AIDS-like diseases. And the manufacturer, that is Bruce Welcome, says it is often difficult to distinguish adverse events possibly associated with cedovudin or cedovudin administration, which is ACT, from underlying signs of HIV disease. In other words, even they acknowledge, not just this, but that, CDV, uh, that AZT causes AIDS or AIDS-defining diseases. Whenever you have clear-cut evidence that a drug works, you have an ethical obligation to immediately let the people who are in the placebo group know so that they can have access. And all of the other trials that are taking place now have a new standard of care. So we would have normally waited several days until the data gets further about the I and cross the T. But the data are not going to change. Some of the numbers may change a little, but the, but the conclusion will not change. In his book, Poison by Prescription, journalist John Lawrenson explains how AZT tests conducted by the FDA and Burroughs Welcome, the manufacturer, were scientifically sloppy and outright fraudulent. During the experiments, patients taking AZT became anemic, suffered low white blood cell counts accompanied by vomiting. Over half had to have blood transfusions. 20% were transfused several times. Despite a warning by FDA toxicology analyst Harvey Chernoff that AZT not be approved, 
the FDA was pressured by AIDS activist organizations to lift the ban, and hundreds of thousands of people began taking AZT, even though AZT cannot cure AIDS and is only supposed to slow down the progression. The mortality rate trended towards being better in the sense of less deaths in the remdesivir group. 8% versus 11% in the placebo group. It has not yet reached statistical significance, but the data needs to be further analyzed. The logic behind AZT treatment is flawed, even if one believes HIV causes AIDS, because HIV only infects about one T-cell in 1,000. 999 healthy T-cells must die to kill the one cell that is infected, and this can only happen early on before HIV becomes dormant and is still making DNA. Yet AIDS patients are given AZT for months on into years, randomly destroying DNA in all parts of the body. AZT is expensive and costs between $8,000 and $12,000 a year, most of which is paid for directly or indirectly by the taxpayer. Earl's Welcome, now Glaxo Welcome, the manufacturer, has generated sales over $1 billion a year with AZT. Because of rules allowed by the FDA, a bottle of AZT that costs about $5 to make can be sold for over $500 as a prescription, and much of this markup is being subsidized by the taxpayer. The treatment causes a very similar condition we would expect from an AIDS patient. That's why nobody noticed that there was something wrong with the treatment. I remember in 1992, after I first tested positive, I became involved in an organization called Women at Risk. There were 11 of us at the time on the board and involved in the group. All of us except three were on the medications. In the year and a half that I was involved with Women at Risk, every single woman in that organization on the drugs died. Every single one except the three of us who weren't taking them. We weren't just given handfuls of AZT, we demanded it. AZT We considered the FDA not giving us these things as being anti-gay instead of being responsible. And so we went and we lobbied and we pushed for all these things and we didn't think clearly about what it was we were asking for. It's like that saying, be, caref be careful what you ask for, it may come to pass. Whenever you have clear-cut evidence that a drug works, you have an ethical obligation to immediately let the people who are in the placebo group know so that they can have access. And all of the other trials that are taking place now have a new standard of care. So we would have normally waited several days until the data gets further about the I and cross the T. But the data are not going to change. Some of the numbers may change a little, but the, but the conclusion will not change. We die! We die! We die! ACT UP wanted to speed up the approval process for new drugs. One of our greatest demonstrations and most famous was at the FDA. And it was uh, over a thousand demonstrators, almost all people with HIV, uh, uh, demanding to be heard. I know that there are drugs out there that can save my life, and I want to know why they're not being tested more quickly. I began to get beyond the rhetoric and the theater of the demonstrations and to really listen to what it is that they were saying. So I invited a group of them up to my conference room and we spent a couple of hours talking about their concerns. And again, it just confirmed in my own mind that most of their concerns were really quite valid. So to explain this for people that might be new to this particular kind of fraud, here's how it works. You create a fake activist group to push an agenda seemingly on behalf of society or an oppressed minority when in fact you're controlling that group for your own purposes. 
Now, does that mean that everybody who was ever a member of ACT UP or ever went to a demonstration was in on it, in on the, on the game? And the answer is no, because part of the game of creating these fake groups is also to attract legitimate people, mislead them, and weaponize them. And that's exactly what the drug companies did with ACT UP. Now, the question is, were they playing Tony Fauci, or was Tony Fauci playing along? Let's take a, a close look at an in-depth narrative he gave about his experience with ACT UP. Watch his body language, and you tell me. Very early on in the course of this pandemic, the activists uh, were making extremely good points about the uniqueness of this, the need to do more, the need to be less rigid in our regulatory approaches towards the approval and testing of new drugs, and the rigidity and lack of flexibility in how we design clinical trials, all of which were the classical way to approach drug development, therapeutic developments, clinical trials, and FDA approval. Um, they wanted to get our attention so they would do it in a very theatrical way and they scared a lot because for the most part the scientific community and the regulatory community are conservative and I say conservative I don't mean conservative in an ideological political way but conservative in their approach towards science it's nice to that people are interested who are not scientists but leave them out of it and lets us scientists make the decision so they didn't pay much attention to the uh, activists. I, for one reason or other, began reading intensively what they were writing, and even though when they were demonstrating and closing down Wall Street and invading St. Patrick's Cathedral and doing things like that, looking very eccentric and scary to some people, I try to phase that out and just listen to what they said and re read what they wrote, and they were making perfect sense. So since I was always out there as a government official, they equated me, my face, my name, with the federal government. So they began to demonstrate against the NIH. And right here on our campus, they you know, came in, invaded the campus, smoke bombs, you know, wanting to get arrested. And I made probably the best decision in my interaction with community is that I agreed with what they were saying. We weren't just given handfuls of ACT, we demanded it. We didn't think clearly about what it was we were asking for. It's like that saying, be, caref be careful what you ask for, it may come to pass. The Wellcome Foundation, UK manufacturer of AZT, saw its shares spiral upwards. AZT was to be the new wonder drug. Then in 1989, after further trials were terminated early in the United States because results looked promising, it was announced that AZT could be used not only on people with AIDS diseases, but in a much larger group, with HIV and low immune cell counts, but no other symptoms. Welcome shares soared to new heights, adding £1.4 billion to the company's UK stock market value in one day. Before a drug is licensed for use, it normally has to undergo animal toxicity studies and clinical trials in humans. No long-term animal studies were completed when AZT was licensed. The clinical studies in humans called Phase 2, which led to the licensing of AZT, were financed by Wellcome. They were presented as complying with the only reliable scientific test for a drug, double-blind studies, and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in July 1987. The study fell apart. I mean, it bombed in so many ways. Oh. I, I showed the article, I, I wrote on it to my colleagues in survey research, and they were absolutely struck down. They could not believe the levels of incompetence that were there at all different levels, including things that are purely mechanical, but like the, the ability to design a, an appropriate questionnaire form. Um, but yes, of course, um, a drug which is supposed to be given for the rest of somebody's life if you have something tested for only a few weeks so you have a very poor idea of you know what to expect from it. In, in, especially the Boston study they would claim someone was in much longer than, than uh, 
was claimed on the, the, the case report forms. And this meant that simply the doctors uh, received a great deal more money. But far more important than this was the uh, reporting of the adverse effects, the toxicities. And this was, you know, the heart of what the study was to measure, that it was safe. And there were, many of their patients were, would have died from the toxicities of ACT if they had not been given emergency blood transfusions. This is serious um, adverse effect. It means literally that, that they would have died from the poison. And yet the case report forms, which showed up eventually as official data, um, they would report no adverse effects. I mean, this is a type of dishonesty. It's hard to go any further than that. Well, the most outrageous case, I forget which one it was, but was someone who had already been taking ACT, which a few people could. You know, they wanted the new miracle drug, and they were able to get it before it was approved for marketing. And he was entered as a, a patient in the placebo group. Even though he was still taking ACT, uh, he dropped out almost immediately, but continued to take ACT, and then he died. And they called him a, a death in the placebo group. I mean, it's, it's hard to cheat any more than that. Of those who were given ACT, uh, they all suffered really severe side effects. Side effects is misleading, toxicities. But um, a number of them would, would very definitely have died from anemia, which uh, in the, the review of animal studies, uh, ACT causes anemia in every species of animal that's ever been studied, including human beings. But th they would have died if they had not been given emergency blood transfusions. And yet, according to the official data, the case report forms, these people had no adverse you know, reactions. The, the one single most unforgivable thing, uh, I mean, there was cheating. There's no reason to believe that Boston, one of 12 centers, was the only one in which cheating took place. It's very likely that the, the same cheating, maybe even worse, took place in all 11 others. It's just that Boston happened to get an honest investigative team that did their work. Um, Many of the others were going to be investigated thoroughly, and then they said, oh, we just don't have time. So we don't know. Um, but to me, the single worst thing is that they deliberately used data they knew were false. This, you know, that, that's the one single thing that can never be forgiven. And we did the first randomized placebo controlled trial with AZT, which turned out to give an effect that was modest from scientific meetings, from these conferences, from my personal contacts with people in the field, I can tell you that I've found no evidence anywhere that people live longer, better lives who take these anti-HIV drugs, these protease inhibitors, either in, alone or in cocktails, as compared to a similar group of HIV positive people who do not take these drugs. So I do not know where the evidence is for the claims that you see in the New York Times or in CNN or wherever you see it, that people are living longer, better lives as a consequence of taking these drugs. There's two types of antiviral drugs. One is the AZT style drug, also known as nucleoside analogs. What these drugs do essentially is they just kill cells. The other type of antiviral drug, these are the protease inhibitors. And what they do is they interfere with the activities of an enzyme called protease. Viruses, some viruses have proteases, but so do healthy human cells. Either style of drug, you give it to a human and you either kill or harm healthy cells. The results of the early AZT trial on people with full-blown AIDS appeared to be so convincing that the drug was given a new fast-track approval by the United States Food and Drug Administration before any long-term toxicity trials in animals had been completed. These new regulations specifically will have special criteria that would apply to immediately life-threatening conditions. Recognizing that such patients are willing ex to accept the greater risk than that which normally would be the case. The Wellcome Foundation, UK manufacturer of AZT, saw its shares spiral upwards. AZT was to be the new wonder drug. 
Then, in 1989, after further trials were terminated early in the United States because results looked promising, it was announced that AZT could be used not only on people with AIDS diseases, but in a much larger group, with HIV and low immune cell counts, but no other symptoms. Welcome shares soared to new heights, adding £1.4 billion to the company's UK stock market value in one day. Commercial interests are definitely part of the problem here. And it's also our collective inability or challenge to say, all this time, all these years, all these lives, all these billions and billions of dollars, can we just stop a second and go back to the very beginning and make sure we've got this right? I mean, that is so hard to do. People don't even know it's a lie. I mean, you know, there, it's, it's not so much a lie as business as usual. I mean, having been in business for a long time, I was in advertising for a long time, and then I had this very successful clothing company. The business of a business is to be in business. You need to find new markets. You need to find new customers. You need to increase your profit margins. If that means going offshore, if that means, you know, taking over new territories, if it means coming up with new products that more people are want, and the ideal of every business is to have a government mandate for your product. The antiviral drugs are chemotherapies. They're all based on chemotherapies that have been developed 30 years ago, long before AIDS was known to, to kill human cells. Chemotherapy is restricted to a few months and hope the cancer dies before you die. If you started taking any other chemotherapeutic agent for the rest of your life, it would be that agent probably that killed you. You know, when you give chemotherapy to somebody with cancer, you give them a round of it for maybe 14 days or a few days. Hopefully, you're not going to kill the patient. You're going to kill the cancer. The patient's going to survive. But you don't keep giving it to him until he dies, because he certainly will. We went from nothing, not even knowing what the virus was, to discovering the virus, developing drugs, and then having a phenomenal response. The epidemic went from a few gay men to now, today, 78 million people having been infected, 39 million deaths, 35 million people living with HIV, and the epidemic still rages with over 2 million new infections each year. They're taking the show to the third world, and they're um, not only giving AZT to um, what will probably be millions of women in the third world, whether they're HIV positive or not, but they're also um, ins insisting that they stop breastfeeding and start formula feeding. Mother's milk, which uh, pediatricians around the world will tell you is the healthiest food that a newborn can have because of the uh, immunological properties in mother's milk, that women should in fact cease uh, breastfeeding their young. Now this to me seems something more than just a crime. Uh, this is absolutely diabolical. I, I can't imagine that it'll work out any other way than that you're going to just see tens, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe even more babies dying. And they'll probably say they died of AIDS no matter what happens. So nobody will be even be held accountable this time. Oh, here's the one thing they're doing. So they can demonstrate that, that this has nothing to do with any particular formula company making money off of this situation. They're in, the WHO or UNAIDS or whoever it is is insisting that the formula gets shipped in bottles without labels. We haven't looked carefully at the facts. We've been told numbers ranging from 5 million to 25 million Africans have HIV and that there's going to be an enormous amount of death. But when you actually go to Africa and you interview the physicians working there, you find that these are presumptive diagnoses. One of the things that is important to emphasize from the outset is that the definition of an AIDS case on the African continent uh, differs decisively from what constitutes an AIDS case, say, in North America or Western Europe. A definition was arrived at uh, as a result of a World Health Organization sponsored conference in October of 1985. What resulted was what's known as the Bangui definition. The Bangui definition of an AIDS case in Africa is based on four clinical symptoms. Uh, the clinical symptoms are a high fever, a persistent cough, uh, loose stools for 30 days, 
and a 10% loss of body weight over a two-month period. Uh, by that definition, uh, a Western researcher like myself uh, has had AIDS. Uh, but having gotten on a plane and flown back to California, I'm not considered, of course, an AIDS case. So I think it's important to keep that in mind whenever one looks at the data, the epidemiological data, about what exactly we're counting when it comes to AIDS. The epidemic went from a few gay men to now, today, 78 million people having been infected, 39 million deaths, 35 million people living with HIV, and the epidemic still rages with over 2 million new infections each year. So this is a list of the drugs that have been developed for HIV, and it's extraordinary that I went from 1981 through the middle of the 1990s taking care of people without adequate therapy. And then as the years went by from 1987 through the mid-90s, we developed these 30 drugs. And this I consider one of the most important transformative discoveries in biological sciences. June 5, 1981, the CDC published a Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report describing cases of a rare pneumonia in otherwise healthy young gay men in Los Angeles. But it was from those reports that the great epidemic of AIDS began to mushroom, and we were in the midst of it before we knew it. It was the first MMWR from the CDC in the summer of 1981 reporting curiously five gay men from Los Angeles who were otherwise felt to be healthy, who developed pneumocystis pneumonia, which is only seen in profoundly immunodeficient patients. This is ground zero. This is the AIDS ward is closed now, but for all the progress, Tony is still haunted by the ones he couldn't save. And as a physician, that's the scorecard. And the scorecard was really, really bad for years. You paid a price. Yeah. Personally? Yeah. So I was heading towards a career in classic infectious disease, and then this particular publication landed on my desk in June of 1981. And it was five young men, all gay men from Los Angeles, who presented with a strange infection that you don't see in people except those who have a very compromised immune system. I thought it was a fluke until a month later, another publication came out. Now of 26 people, again, all gay men, now from Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York. This was the beginning of the AIDS pandemic. And I decided at that point, since I was an infectious disease person, intensely interested in the humanities, and this was an extraordinarily devastating disease with no known cause that I devoted my career from that time on to HIV AIDS. And this is a picture of me in the early 1980s at the bedside of an AIDS patient. Now I show it to you because at that time, before we even knew what the virus was, or even if it was a virus, the median survival of my patients was six to eight months, which means that 50% of them would be dead in six to eight months. That is a very difficult thing to go through. I consider it the darkest period of my professional and personal life because I had to deal with every single day, every one of my patients dying. The very first AIDS cases were five gay men diagnosed in Los Angeles in 1981 by a doctor named Michael Gottlieb. And what linked them was that they were all in what was called the fast lane gay lifestyle. They were doing a lot of recreational drugs. They were taking many different drugs at the same time, combining drugs much more than was the pattern for straight drug users. They also 
partied a lot, they went to bars, they went to clubs, they went to bathhouses. They met a lot of men, they had a lot of anonymous sexual contacts. And as a result, they were exposed to a lot of the classic sexually transmitted diseases like syphilis and gonorrhea. And because they were getting those diseases, they were also frequently going to doctors and getting antibiotic prescriptions to treat those. All of that created a situation where a handful of gay men were burning the candle at both ends and putting a blowtorch to the middle. And it's no wonder that after a while their immune system started to collapse and they started getting sick in these unusual ways that previously had only been seen in older people whose immune systems had deteriorated from age. I would watch my friends stay up all night at the baths doing speed and then take uh, a downer and then in the middle of the day in the afternoon they'd be under the covers twitching. I consciously tried to deal with drugs in a in a saner way than than most of my friends did. There was a ton of poppers. They were everywhere. You would walk into a gay bar and on the dance floor it was not unusual to see every probably third person holding a little bottle up to their nose and you could just smell it everywhere. There's a drug called amyl nitrate that was developed in the 1850s and 60s. Came in ampules and they became known as poppers because you'd pop them when you open these ampules up to sniff them when you had coronary artery disease. The first AIDS cases, for example, that Mike Gottlieb reported uh, were all five gay men. They were young. They all used poppers. Poppers. Something you walk around huffing all night. I mean, it, it says flammable, uh, fatal if swallowed on the side of the bottle. They're walking around huffing it all night long. Why? Gives you a great rush. Poppers was a sex drug. They were in every gay bathhouse, every bar, every porno bookstore across the nation. Poppers were visible on the dance floor in the discos. At the end of an evening, the bartender would announce last call for alcohol, last call for poppers. They became a mainstay of the um, gay social scene uh, in the late 1970s. Um, were commonly used uh, by large numbers of people in uh, gay clubs and in the bathhouses. And their risk is that they're actually chemically quite similar to drugs given when doctors want to suppress the immune system, i.e. to transplant patients, uh, the chemistry is rather similar. So it's not at all surprising that uh, people who took these drugs uh, quite often would develop uh, immune suppression. The scene is, is shown in a bathhouse in San Francisco, but it's actually based on a visit that Bill Darrow, one of our research sociologists, and I made to the club baths here in Atlanta. And we were particularly interested in learning more about poppers, nitrite inhalants. So we showed up wearing our government blue blazers. Uh, we were the only ones wearing clothes, so we were fairly obvious. And we sat at a little car table and said, excuse me, can I talk to you? And uh, the men were actually incredibly cooperative. They were happy to talk about uh, what they were doing and particularly about these inhalants. Um, these inhalants actually could be bought in the bathhouse in these bottles with names on them like locker room, which is very appropriate because these things smell like sweat socks. But they could also be bought in these more mysterious looking brown bottles in gay bookstores and bars. And they were being used to enhance gay sex. So we thought, well, what, you know, what's in this stuff? Is it possible there's a contaminant that's causing immunodeficiency? So we bought some. I don't know how we put it on our government credit cards. <laughs> uh, we brought them back to CDC, the Environmental Health Laboratories, analyzed them, and just found what we thought they had in them, which were butyl, isobutyl, and amyl nitrite. In the 1970s, I remember reading articles in the San Francisco Chronicle, particularly warning uh, gay people about the dangers of poppers. You know, I was, I was quite young. I wasn't out yet. This was the first time I ever heard of poppers being used sexually. In fact, I think it was the first time I heard of them at all. That there were, you know, major front page articles in the San Francisco Chronicle serving a city famous for having a large gay community saying, you know, wait a minute, these things are highly dangerous. Uh, they you know, had certain medical uses, they were an emergency drug, they weren't designed to be used every night and they could do serious damage to your body. 
Though there are no government-funded studies that examine the long-term effects of drug use in this war on AIDS, the medical literature is full of cases of AIDS-like symptoms among drug addicts. Since 1909, we've observed the horrendous effects of heroin, morphine, speed, cocaine, and other injected drugs on the immune system. Today, thousands of American junkies who are not infected with HIV are losing the same CD4 T cells and getting the same diseases as AIDS patients. How has the war on AIDS addressed this issue? We've passed out clean needles and told addicts to avoid getting HIV. But one drug that was available legally, nitrite inhalants, commonly known as poppers, are used extensively. Poppers are believed to be the direct cause of Kaposi's sarcoma, a rare form of skin cancer that afflicts the nose, throat, lungs, and skin. Kaposi sarcoma has been an indicator disease of AIDS, but it is often found in gay men who are not infected with HIV. In a study published by Toby Eisenstein, rodents showed an immediated dose response in immune suppression after being exposed to nitrites found in poppers. Oh, I think that's very revealing. Uh, it showed that NO, nitric oxide radical, is terribly immunosuppressive. But interestingly enough, all of the literature on NO, and I follow, follow it rather carefully at, uh, by computer, never mentions a more butyl nitrite, never mentions the word poppers. It's as almost these two worlds are living side by side, but they don't, are not talking to each other. There have been a number of theories as to what the origin of HIV AIDS is. One of them was a theory that certainly turned out to be completely incorrect, that it's a lifestyle phenomenon. For a while in the 1970s, the main financial supports of the gay press were bar ads and popper ads. That if you were a gay publisher in the 70s and you got a contract from enough of the national poppers makers, uh, you could keep your paper in business. That uh, you know, in the, it was in that era what the um, 976 uh, phone sex lines were in the 1980s and what uh, AIDS drugs had been in the 1990s. You know, the big national account that you wanted for your gay paper in order to have a stable revenue stream and stay in business. The popper manufacturers had become such an enormous economic powerhouse in the gay community that they were making enormous amounts of money themselves manufacturing and selling poppers and they were spending a lot of advertising money in the gay press and keeping the gay media in business. So obviously the poppers manufacturers had a vested interest in making sure their product was not blamed for AIDS. The gay media had a vested interest in making sure that poppers were not blamed for AIDS and therefore the coverage in the gay media skewed away from poppers and other similar risk factors and towards the viral hypothesis. An industry developed around them, which actually made it, you know, fifty billion dollars a year or more. I discovered there was a very extensive medical literature on uh, the, the volatile nitrites. Uh, they are very, very bad indeed for the health. In fact, I should probably describe what they they do. The toxicities. The simplest thing is that they're very powerful oxidizing agents, which is is bad. Uh, Poppers cause severe anemia, in fact, several types of anemia. Uh, and secondly, power, poppers are, are powerfully mutagenic, meaning that they cause cellular changes. And, and this is bad news because substances uh, that are mutagenic uh, are almost also uh, carcinogenic. So at any rate, uh, Hank Wilson and I tried to you know, get the word out to gay men. Uh, we had a hard time because gay publications were all running, you know, every issue, uh, a dozen ads for poppers. This was a large part of the revenue. And uh, 
there were only you know a few gay publications that would even print a letter from Hank or me, you know, let alone an article. There were none of the early AIDS cases who had not used poppers. But I, I've done my own independent research, which I describe in the AIDS war. Uh, one of my informants, Artie Felsen, who was very, very active and outgoing in the, the People with AIDS Coalition, uh, claimed that he had interviewed several hundred you know, gay men with AIDS. And he said that virtually all of them had been heavy users of drugs. But he said, without a single exception, they had all been uh, poppers users. utterly fraudulent, uh, more fraudulent in the conception really than the execution. But they again assumed that poppers were used as room, room odorizers. And when you have such a totally dishonest uh, assumption to begin with, everything else that falls will be, you know, equally uh, fraudulent. The, the doses of the mice were exposed to, you know, might not have been one one thousandth what gay men would get in, in the course of a single evening. Just simply being infected with HIV is not going to do it. You need certain cofactors. Cofactors are not necessary. Dr. Fancher would say HIV causes AIDS without the need for anything else. That's kind of ridiculous. The data that indicate that any different type of infection like mycoplasma or something like that is a necessary cofactor. I believe those theories have been debunked. What the fuck does he mean? Sorry. What's it in um, sorry, the camera? <laughs> what does he mean that there are no cofactors? Where's he coming from? There's cofactors for everything. And I understand there are a lot of people, if you ask them about HIV causing AIDS as being a fact, they'll say, of course, it's indisputable. And the very fact that they will say it's indisputable might lead you to question their ability to understand the scientific method. People who think any scientific fact is indisputable don't understand about scientific fact. It has become a very emotional kind of thing because people actually, they get personally committed to what really is a body of evidence that can be analyzed, you know, by lots of people. And, and at this point, there's so much of it out there, nobody can really analyze it, all of it. But nobody can write a review of it that says HIV causes AIDS because of this. You know, if a postdoc were to write a review of the literature that showed without much doubt that HIV was the cause of AIDS, that guy would be famous. Now there's a uh, hundred thousand guys out there who had the opportunity. It's Ten years has passed. We've been waiting for this star postdoctoral fella to distinguish himself forever and get a lifelong grant from Tony Fauci, but he hasn't shown up. No one has bothered to write a definitive review. Any journal would take it. That right there proves that HIV does not cause AIDS. Let's just talk for a moment about testing. What are your thoughts on someone going out and getting a quote-unquote AIDS test? Really, when we say it's an AIDS test, that's a misnomer. It's not a test for AIDS at all. And surprisingly, something that it took me a long time to figure out, it's not even a test for HIV. The test is for antibodies that are supposed to be antibodies to HIV, but they're not. It's a test for nonspecific antibodies that may or may not have anything to do with HIV. A very heavily referenced review article on the validity of the HIV tests had more or less concluded that they had never been validated. Uh, at the time, I didn't quite realize that one of the implications in this article was that HIV itself had never properly been isolated. It was so difficult to isolate and obtain that that was the reason why the HIV tests had never been validated because to validate a, a diagnostic test according to the classical decent standards you need to show that patients who test positive with your antibody kit have got the virus in them and patients who don't test positive are free of the virus. Broadly, that would be how you would establish its, its validity. And that had never been done because you can't find this virus in AIDS patients or in HIV positive patients. HIV, first of all, nobody's ever found it in a human being. Think of it. The, the so-called HIV tests do not detect HIV in a person. 
They detect your antibodies that react to some proteins that are produced at Abbott Laboratory. They do not find HIV in the person. They find a person's functioning immune system that could react against HIV if it were there. Millions of people take tests that are referred to as HIV tests. However, the idea that there is a laboratory test that can determine whether or not a person is infected with the virus is simply an illusion. The FDA has never approved a test kit that claims to be used uh, for the purpose of diagnosing HIV infection. The ultimate test in, that the establishment offers is what's called a co-culture technique, where you take a sample of the individual's blood cells, white blood cells. You cannot find HIV now in this sample. All you have are these blood cells. But then you culture these cells with some special cells that Robert Gallo uh, generated some years ago. You have to throw in some powerful chemicals, phytohemagglutinin or IL-2, for example, to force these cells to do anything. The idea is to wake up the patient cells to start producing RNA and then this RNA will be coated in a protein and possibly then there will be viral particles produced in the medium. These viral particles now will go infect the other cells that you added and then you will amplify uh, by a period of time the replication of this, these viral particles in the laboratory, what we call in vitro. Now these particles did not exist in the patient, in the human being, the person that you got the sample from. You created them in the laboratory. And by creating these, these virus particles in the laboratory, people say they have uh, isolated HIV from a human being. They have not done any such thing. Nobody was, was looking at the blood of an AIDS patient and finding it crawling with some new organism and said, hey, this is this virus that we call HIV now. Is there a test that can definitively tell you if you're infected with virus? With the virus, sure. What is that test? Well, you can, you can, the, the test uh, is to do the, uh, the ELISA test, which really demonstrates, and it, yes, in essence, it's a surrogate also because it represents antibody production to the virus. But they have demonstrated the virus. They have crystal, they tried crystalline uh, uh, models of the virus. HIV exists. I don't recommend people ever getting tested. Uh, the reason is, I don't know what the tests mean and I think no one else knows what the tests mean. I've never seen any evidence that what these tests purport to show, they're actually showing, namely the presence of a virus, the presence of an exogenous virus. I really would like to see the electron microscopic data of this and apparently there is none. There is none where you've done a rigorous isolation protocol. The test is for antibodies that are supposed to be antibodies to HIV, but they're not. It's a test for nonspecific antibodies that may or may not have anything to do with HIV. So it's, it's not at all like we're being told, and, and it's really, when you think about it, if you're told that testing is responsible, it's a pretty irresponsible test to be taking. Um, in the gay community, everybody tests all the time. Everybody around me was taking HIV tests, it's a responsible thing to do. It's sort of a, a gay rite of passage to regularly get tested. Um, you know, and consequently many people around me um, tested positive. Mm -hmm. Since AIDS is advanced HIV infection as opposed to early HIV infection. AIDS is when you're ill uh, and HIV infection without AIDS is when you're heading towards being ill but you're not ill. I always assumed that if you were 
if you had AIDS, as opposed to being just HIV positive, that you were very sick, that you had pneumonia or KS or chronic diarrhea or something. Um, that changed for me when I myself was diagnosed with AIDS. And I was diagnosed not because of an illness, not because I was sick or that my immune system didn't seem to be working, but because my CD4 count had dropped below 200, which according to the CDC definition is what defines AIDS, an HIV positive test and a CD4 count of less than 200. In 1993, in this country, we adopted a definition that caused the number of AIDS cases to double overnight. And part of that reason was, for the first time, we began counting people as AIDS victims who were not ill and who did not have any symptoms. They had a low T-cell count. And that's only one low T-cell count. T-cells are something that can fluctuate 100% in a given day. So based on a low T-cell count, that year, the number of AIDS cases doubled overnight, and with that definition, there have been 182,000 Americans who are not ill, diagnosed with AIDS, who would not have AIDS if they moved to Canada, because in Canada, they don't recognize that T-cell definition as a criteria for having an AIDS diagnosis. Most people consider it blasphemous when you point out that AIDS is not a disease. It's a syndrome. It's a collection of diseases, and those diseases get called AIDS if they occur in a patient that the doctor somehow concludes is HIV positive. All of the diseases in the category called AIDS occur to people who are HIV negative. None of them are exclusive to people who test HIV positive and all of them have causes and treatments that are known, well known, they're completely unrelated to HIV. So any of the, these diseases, when they happen to somebody who tests HIV negative, are called by their old name. But when they occur in someone who tests HIV positive, then they're called AIDS. All kinds of diseases started coming into the AIDS family faster than anyone should have been comfortable with, really. To go from two or three to go to, to 30 in a few years was like somebody should have said, hey, there's something wrong here, and it's got to be financial. Things don't happen that fast in science. <laughs> you don't suddenly notice that one new organism is causing every problem. I mean, it was a bizarre thing that happened. It really was. It didn't really have any precedence in terms of, of medicine before that, unless perhaps you could think of the possession by the devil stuff, right? You see, once you're possessed by the devil, anything that happens to you or anything you do is, is got to do with that, right? So it makes it easier for you to get tuberculosis, and it makes it easier for you to get uterine cancer. It makes it easier for you to get candida albicans. And so all those things can now be called AIDS. Now, why would anybody do that? And why would any reasonable doctor start lumping together various symptoms into one pile and think all oh, this is caused by HIV? We have a test, but it's not a test for AIDS. And it's called an HIV test, but it's not a test for HIV. And we have a series of problems that we are calling AIDS, but that doesn't elevate AIDS into a disease. It's, I don't know if you read magazines lately, there's a lot of ads for pharmaceutical drugs lately. These pharmaceutical companies are, are marketing more and more direct to consumers and encouraging you to ask your doctor for the remedy of the day. And I notice that there's a lot of these syndromes popping up, like a, uh, social anxiety disorder or SAD. I mean, you can make a syndrome out of anything you want, basically, and then find medicines to sell to make people better from it. And AIDS is not that, you know, ludicrously simple, but it is, in a sense, just as constructed. It's a, it's a construct. It's, it's a category of other problems, some of which were occurring in greater numbers in a very small subset of people here in the U.S. and other parts of the world that became, due to the social political climate with regard to sex, death, homosexuality, and drug use, it became elevated into this medical phenomenon that has become untouchable and, and sacred almost. There's the saying that if, if you knew how sausages, what sausages are made of, most people would hesitate to sort of eat them because they, they, 
you wouldn't like what's in it. And if, if you knew how HIV AIDS numbers are cooked uh, or made up, you would use them with extreme caution. In late December of 2007, I read about new legislation passed in New Jersey calling for the mandatory testing of pregnant women or newborn infants should the mother's status be unknown. HIV mandatory testing, to me, is a no-brainer. I'm very much opposed to the concept of mandatory testing of any population because the tests are scientifically shown to be unreliable and inaccurate. You have no reason to fear this bill. And my hope is that eventually this will become a federal law so that every woman in this country could be tested. But HIV testing isn't an absolutely precise science. When I confronted my doctor about that, she said, we're way past Western blot now. We have the viral load test. That when you get the package insert for the viral load test, it says... If you test positive, you are considered confirmed infected with HIV. But at the bottom of the page, in fine print, it states a person should have additional testing. It does not allow you to tell a single person on this planet that they are HIV positive. And it's a scandal that this test continues to be used. So again, I'm asking, where's the test? Where's the test that can confirm a diagnosis of HIV infection? And I can't find one. In light of all this scientific uncertainty, I asked Dr. Fauci for evidence linking HIV to immune deficiency disease. When you put the combined findings of the initial characterization as a distinct retrovirus isolated by Montagnier and his group, together with Gallo linking the virus to being the cause of AIDS, and they put those things together, and that's how we have a confirmation of the causative agent of, H of, of AIDS, namely HIV. Still unclear about the evidence for HIV's existence, I decided the best way to verify it would be to actually see it. I asked Dr. Hans Gelderblom, a world-renowned electron microscopist, if he thought there was any reason to question Dr. Montagnier's published images. I've seen these publications, stamp-sized images. It's a nuisance. It's a nuisance. You do not really see much. When we saw that photo, we said, mm, suggestive, but not convincing. Dr. Gallo, one year later, published photographs he claimed to be of HIV. Were his any better? These pictures were not so uh, impressive. They were not much better than Montagnier's images. It's one thing to look like, and another thing is to be a virus. In 2002, I stumbled across an article by Valander Turner and Andrew McIntyre of the Perth Group in Australia, and it questioned whether there's ever even been found a virus. I became consumed with researching this. I could read from morning till night, morning till night every day, and every link to another link, and I would email to these people and say, where's the test? I want to know. Am I dying? Am I contagious? And they weren't even very kind. They were just like, read our articles again. How many times do we have to tell you? So where does all this lead? Well, to recap, what we've seen is that back in the 80s and uh, 90s and even through the present day, this idea of testing people for AIDS uh, was a fraud. Uh, what it really was was an HIV test, and that turned out to be a fraud too because you really can't test reliably for HIV. So what does that mean? Does that, does that matter? Does that affect anybody? Well, it sure does. Millions of people were given positive HIV tests and were told that they were going to die from AIDS. And then they were terrorized into taking first AZT, which is a very toxic uh, drug. It is a mutagen. It is a carcinogen. It kills cells. And it killed a lot of people. And then uh, Fauci and friends got more sophisticated and they lowered the AZT dose and they mixed it with a whole bunch of other toxic drugs and they called it a cocktail. And then they went out and decided, hey, we're going to test the world. We're going to test pregnant women to make sure they're, they're not carrying the virus. Not that they were sick, not that they had any symptoms, but they wanted to see, are they carrying the virus? And they did the same thing in Africa. And then after they 
increased the number of diseases from 2 to nearly 30 that could be classified as AIDS and after they started a global testing program of quote vulnerable populations which just coincidentally happened to be people not in a position to defend themselves easily uh, they started to find AIDS everywhere uh, including in Africa but including in the United States and wouldn't you know one of the communities they found a lot of AIDS was the African American community and they tested a lot of women and they found a lot of HIV positive women and they decided well let's go forward and see what uh, Dr. Fauci decided to do. We're at NIH today to talk to Dr. Tony Fauci about the Mississippi baby. Doctor, can you tell us about the announcement that was made this week? Well the Mississippi baby as many people know now because it got considerable publicity was a child that was born of a mother who was HIV infected but who unfortunately had no prenatal care and was not receiving any retroviral drugs. Did you get that? This is a woman who had a positive HIV test which he calls HIV infected. Okay, Not the same thing, not accurate, not scientifically sound as we've seen before but he makes that leap and then he says unfortunately the mother was not getting drugs so in Tony Fauci's world if you are a poor African-American woman or a poor African woman and you come up positive on one of these unreliable tests in his world the best thing that could possibly happen to you is that you would be given a lot of carcinogenic and mutagenic drugs to quote control the virus a mother who was HIV infected but who unfortunately had no prenatal care and was not receiving any retroviral drugs and at the time of birth within the first 30 hours of birth the baby was put on a therapeutic dose regimen of antiretroviral drugs as opposed to waiting to see if the baby was infected and only giving him a prophylactic or a prevention dose so if you heard what uh, Tony Fauci said there the mother was positive on an HIV test no indication of whether she was sick no indication of whether she had any symptoms and they called her HIV infected and they went ahead and gave this newborn baby antiviral drugs at birth based just on that and nothing else they didn't even bother to test the infant with one of the bogus HIV test to see if the baby was positive or not. Just gave the baby drugs. Powerful carcinogenic, mutagenic drugs. As it turned out, the aggressive approach towards the baby was the right choice because the baby turned out to be infected. The baby was treated with combination antiretroviral drugs for 18 months and then was unfortunately lost to follow up. And over that period of time, the baby was not receiving any antiretroviral drugs and when the baby returned to clinic which was five months later the physicians examined the baby and found to their surprise that there was no detectable virus at all you know speechless right without you know ba based on a unreliable test based on no symptoms based on nothing uh, they and, and then not even testing the infant they decided to put the infant on antiviral drugs and they consider that a good thing to do and then luckily temporarily at least the uh, child escaped the clutches of these maniacs uh, for a period of several months and when they retested the infant the infant had no HIV in that particular test and we already know how unreliable and nonsensical uh, all those tests are and uh, Fauci expresses surprise now there's a lot of twists and turns in this case and it just goes on and on and on and Fauci keeps twisting it and twisting it and twisting it until he proves what he wants to prove which is it's a good idea to do these kinds of things it's a good idea to use an unreliable test on pregnant women and if they come up with a positive reading to put them on antivirals and then when their infants are born no need to test them and any don't even need to have a pretense of testing them just put them on antivirals too so uh, this is what's going on in the United States right now uh, this is what's going on in Africa uh, millions of people 
uh, if if their numbers are correct, I mean, they may be taking a lot of the money and just stealing it. We don't know what these people are doing, but we do know that a, a definite number of actual real people are being subjected to this horror. All right? And why does this matter? Well, uh, there's a deadly virus floating around, and clearly uh, Tony Fauci is in charge of how the media is going to talk about it, and um, we're being told we all need to be tested for it. Uh, we're not told whether these tests are reliable or unreliable or not. Uh, it is strange that there's multiple different kinds of tests. If there's a test that works, why aren't we using the one that works? Um, well, this could, be, this could be the HIV test all over again. But here's the consequences for you. If you don't have the antibodies, they're going to suggest to you that you need the newly minted uh, COVID-19 vaccination. And it may be a little bit more than a suggestion. It may be mandatory. Or if you, just, if you decline to get it, you may find yourself uh, facing uh, some significant restrictions. Uh, like maybe you won't be able to get on an airplane. Maybe you won't be able to leave and or return to the country. That may seem extreme. Well, here's Bill Gates, Tony Fauci's best buddy, telling you how he'd like it to be. Trade-off, you just mentioned, obviously, the economic pain. What do you think the right balance is between the trade-off of protecting people's lives and the economic hit? I mean, do you see a situation where the global economy could be virtually at a standstill for a year or even more? Well, it won't go to zero, but it will shrink. Global GDP is going to take, uh, you know, probably the biggest hit ever, you know, maybe the Depression was worse or 1873. I don't know. But in my lifetime, there, this will be the greatest economic hit. But you don't have a choice. People act like you have a choice. People don't feel like going to the stadium uh, when they might get infected. You know, it, it's not the government who's saying, OK, just ignore this disease. And, you know, people are deeply affected by seeing these deaths, by knowing they could be part of the transmission chain and you know, old people, uh, their parents, their grandparents could be affected by this. And so you don't, you know, you don't get to say, uh, ignore uh, what's going on here. There, are, there will be the ability, particularly in rich countries, to open up if things are done well over the next few months. But for the world at large, Normalcy only returns when we've largely vaccinated the entire global population. And, and so, you know, although there's a lot of work on testing, a lot of work on drugs that we're involved with, you know, trying to achieve that ambitious goal, which has never been done for the vaccine, that rises to the top of the list. Eventually, what we'll have to have is certificates of who's a recovered person, who's a vaccinated person, because you don't want people moving around the world where you'll have some countries that won't have it under control. Sadly, you don't want to completely block off the ability for those you know, people to go there and come back and move around. People to go there and come back and move around. So eventually there will be sort of this digital uh, immunity proof uh, that it will help facilitate the global reopening up. AIDS is a chronic long-term breakdown of the immune system that can be caused by multiple factors, generally more than one of them operating within any particular person with AIDS or with what has been described as AIDS. And at the top of that in the West would be recreational drug use, also pharmaceutical drug use, um, repeated infections, uh, including infections with diseases that are genuinely sexually transmitted, repeated antibiotic treatments for these, uh, a lifestyle that involves uh, a lot of partying, lack of nutrition, uh, and uh, in uh, the less developed world, uh, AIDS is primarily a disease of malnutrition, starvation, and the endemic infections that have been part of those uh, environments for years. Looking back, you know, over 25 years, oh, 
I think I'm probably the longest running AIDS dissident. Um, you know, this began my, I began in earnest, well actually in about 1981, but you know, in earnest in 1983. And my first major AIDS article was in 1985. So I was, you know, two years ahead of Duisburg. In the early days, the very early AIDS cases were really quite sick. And there, there were very good reasons why they were sick, mostly drugs, but not entirely. Some, you know, had been born sick. But then at a certain point, when really when that sort of AIDS had virtually ceased to exist, there became a new type of AIDS. So they expanded the definition and also they began giving the, the anti-HIV drugs to people who were in fact not even sick, but merely positive on the HIV tests. Uh, and in that case, um, of course, I mean, uh, when they finally became sick enough from the AIDS drugs, then they were called AIDS patients. I would simply have to say that my main concern is the, the gay men who have been murdered. I don't think murder is too strong a word to use when you have a drug like ACT and, and all of the nucleoside analogs that followed, you know, more or less on its coattail. Um, approved on the basis of fraudulent research and where, as you know, Joseph Sondheim said, ACT is incompatible with life. Well, if it's incompatible with life, it's a poison. And if it's a poison that kills people, uh, in context like that, it's murder. What do you know, John? What, do you, uh, what would you guess for the number of people who were really sickened and killed who had no presenting illnesses, just a positive test for the proteins, for the antibodies that were supposed to be specific to, to HIV. How many people were we killing with this drug? Well, here one has to guess. I mean, I followed the CDC's statistics very well year by year, but then they started, or they stopped reporting certain things. But I have a pretty good estimate that a third of a million gay men uh, were killed by ACT poisoning. And I have a table I created um, it's on my website somewhere. Wow. Uh, I would say, I don't even know now. They, they stopped reporting AIDS deaths by year, which made it impossible to track certain things. Yeah, I noticed that also, that the, the, the statistics, especially around 1997, was a big year where the next year, all of a sudden, they'd they removed all the good stuff out of the reports. All that really they concentrate now on is how many cases there are in each city and each state, which I guess is purely for funding purposes. Well, I think it's deliberate. I don't think they want, uh, to, you know, tracking to be done on, on, the, on their statistics. I, well, if you take a look at their own statistics, though, you take a look at those 1983, 84, 85, 86, 87, really, we're talking a relative handful in a country of then to 50 million, to 60, to 70 million people, maybe five, 10,000 people. It really wasn't until the late 80s when AZT came along that we really saw, even by their own figures, the number of deaths attributed to AIDS going up, that was at the point that this chemotherapy for life, this harsh drug, AZT, was being introduced. The epidemic went from a few gay men to now, today, 78 million people having been infected, 39 million deaths, 35 million people living with HIV, and the epidemic still rages with over 2 million new infections each year. So this is a list of the drugs that have been developed for HIV, and it's extraordinary that I went from 1981 through the middle of the 1990s taking care of people without adequate therapy. And then as the years went by from 1987 through the mid-90s, we developed these 30 drugs, and this I consider one of the most important transformative discoveries in biological sciences.